Welcome to Tomorrow Never Knows with me, Bob Wilson, and some Warren Brown of the Beatles Kingdom. Our guest is author Patricia Gallo Stenman. Patricia will be talking about her wonderful book, Diary of a Beatle Maniac. She gives her accounts, which are really incredible, first hand accounts of people she met related to the Beatles and how her friends got into them, and it's really exciting. So, welcome, everybody. Hello, how are you? Welcome, uh, Patricia. Good. And Sir Warren, can you hear us in the Beatles Kingdom? Uh, yes, I can. Can you hear me? I can hear you, so we're in business. Uh, hey, guys, do you know where I go when I want to be online surfing like the kids and I want to I wanna look up all things about the Beatles? Where do you go? Where do you go? I go to the Beatles Magazine. It's a publication with 370-plus million visitors in all their pages. It's read by thousands of fans around the world each and every day. There's Beatle news updated daily, 24 hours, audio, video, photos, interviews, contests, you say, additional material, and more. Follow Beatles Magazine, the most complete online coverage, 24 hours a day, and how many days a week? Eight, Eight days, days a week. A week. <laughs> All right. So, Beatles Magazine, we love you. So, getting down to business here. Welcome, Patricia. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me on your program. Thank you for coming to the Beatles Kingdom here. <laughs> you seem to have been a natural writer from the start. Uh, can you describe your early writing efforts and, and how they came about and led into the Beatles? Oh, sure. Actually, my, my love for writing dates way back uh, in grade school uh, when I wrote for our little elementary school newspaper in Philadelphia, PA. Uh, I lived in inner city Philadelphia. Um, after that, I started scribbling down short stories and I was given a little black journal book by my uncle and I started scribbling things down there when I was 13 in 1962. Um, well, funny, but early in 1964, that little black book started to incorporate news on the Beatles and Beatlemania with my little group of friends. So that's an interesting deal. And the book is like uh, a really fun read. I thought it was really fun because it was personal, but I could relate to, you know, the things that you guys were going through following a band. Um, yeah. When you first beca became aware of the Beatles um, and you talked about your circle of friends, how did they react? And is the image of girls fainting and screaming and going wild that we see in sound bites? The real portrayal of the average female fan. Okay, well, actually, the f the first time I became aware of the Beatles was during the '63 Christmas season, uh, and uh, I saw on our Sunday newspaper magazine for the Philadelphia Bulletin there was a black and white photo essay of this very popular English group that we never saw before or heard of back in you know '63. Um, and there were historical fans in the audience, which was interesting. Um, and I also, about this time, saw a clip of the uh, Beatles performing on the old Jack Parr TV entertainment show. I think it was on a Friday night that used to come on. Um, so the very first reactions we had um, from my high school friends we're following the uh, Sunday evening, February 9th, 1964 appearance on the Ed Sullivan Show. Uh, that's the night. The Beatles were on the Ed Sullivan Show? I never knew that. Okay. Yeah, you know, isn't that an interesting fact, right? <laughs> yeah. I never knew that. I didn't no, know they were on that really yeah, big a little, show. little known fact from the I'm past. sorry I'm being a wise guy back to your regular <laughs> scheduled answer. I apologize. It's okay. But we, we all chose our favorite Beatles uh, that night that night and that was interesting the funny thing is that um the screaming girls that you always see and the fainting girls and the girls being let off you know from shea stadium by the police you know that 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 was a very small group of you know fans of beetle maniacs of course that's what they filmed in those days or took pictures of um my, my my book wanted to point out that uh, that's a stereotype. Uh, that might have been 4% of what we did. You know, we were really intelligent young girls who started fan clubs and uh, 
we got together and listened to music and we stalked outside a hotel and things of that sort we 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 didn't really just scream and and that is a bad stereotype from from that time and i understand that you know that's what they they show you on in the film clips and in the news uh but that really wasn't what we were all about and i want to sort of dispel that rumor <laughs> all right so we got rid of that one that was a good deal Good. Okay. Usually we have to ask our guests about solo concerts, which I know you've seen, and TV appearances. But yep. you are one guest who's actually seen the Beatles live, I think, a multitude of times. Can you tell us about that experience or those experiences? When you sure. Actually yeah. um, I was really blessed, I say, because I lived in Philadelphia, and they appeared twice in Philadelphia over the years, and I was close to New York. So I was able to get to Shea. So I, I, I saw them three times in concert live. Uh, the first was September um, 2nd, 1964 at the Philadelphia Convention Hall. Uh, the second time was August 16th, 1966. That was at John F. Kennedy Stadium in Philadelphia. And then just one week later, I was at the August 23rd 66 Shea Stadium concert in New York. So um, I did see them three times. It was very different. Uh, the first it was very different from the second and third times because um, the first time was an indoor convention hall. Um, I was on the first floor of this convention hall. They had um, folding chairs and I think they were wooden folding chairs in those days. Uh, unfortunately, it was very dark. There was a very bad sound system, as there were in those days, bad sound systems. And um, most of us young girls stood on top of these folding chairs to see if we could peek at them or see them on stage, which led to a lot of fol folding chairs falling over and injuring the young <laughs> Beatle maniacs. Oh, no. Yeah, my, my my girlfriend who was with me, Diane, she cut her leg open when she fell off the chair. Um, and nobody could really see them or hear them because they did not think, you know, that, that it was going to be such bad acoustics in the place. It wasn't set up for, for concerts. It was a convention hall for conventions, uh, maybe, you know, basketball games, that sort of thing. But the other, the last two times I saw them, of course, they had changed to the uh, outdoor stadiums by that time. And uh, yes, there were thousands of thousands of fans, but uh, we could see them, even though they looked like ants, we still could see them. And the uh, PA systems that they had in the baseball, football stadiums were a lot better than the old convention halls with the closed, you know, facilities that they had earlier. So we could hear them and we could see them. Um, what was interesting about all, all three of these concerts is, of course, the Beatles didn't play that long. I think it was 25 minutes uh, topmost. And that the Shea Stadium and the uh, JFK Stadium in Philly, there were several acts before them. Uh, for example, did the they have like plate spinners. Pardon? Did they have like plate spinners and? Yeah, no, no, no. It was all music groups, but they weren't that well known. I mean, uh, you know, the Circle was a, you know, it was a, a rock group from the states. They were on, and there were some other groups, but you know, the Beatles came last. But we, nobody was even listening to the other people. They were just talking you know, until the Beatles came on. So um, it was kind of interesting. But uh, the one thing I remember about Shea so much was, of course, a lot of people had banners. It was crowded except for the top levels. And the humidity was incredibly bad that night. It was, you know, in August in New York. So uh, it was kind of steamy. Uh, so those are kind of, kind of things I remember, plus the fact that, we were, as Philadelphia girls, we went and took Amtrak uh, at age, whatever it was, 15, from Philly that morning down uh, up to New York. And then we came back the same evening. And I remember the, the town of, uh, city of New York was just full of Beatle fans. 
uh, you could tell you always can tell Beatle fans. So uh, it was an interesting day uh, to just stroll around New York before we had to make our way to Shea Stadium. Well, that was brave coming all the way from there by yourselves. That was. Oh yeah, yeah, we did that. Well, we we did that. Um, we also used to go to New York. I, I'll, and I'll tell you later to see Victor Spinetti when he appeared on Broadway. So uh, we kind of got used to taking Amtrak up there for Beatle things. You know, was it like a caravan of girls. Like, so you were kind of in groups. You like were other people doing the same thing? Or was yeah. It no, no. Um, actually, it's it's pretty interesting because um, we had a group. Um, our, I was in high school. I was a freshman in high school, so I was the exact right age for Beatlemania at in 1964. Um, we banded together about the time the Ed Sullivan show uh, was on the air. Uh, in school, we had little groups, and I called. Now I'm calling us in the book. I called us Beetle Buddies, but um, we we weren't called that back then. We weren't called anything. Uh, we bonded together. We supported each member of the group. Um, we had lots of fun with it. We could identify, you know, other Beetle fans, uh, as I said, and we actually took care of one another. The the one thing I bring out in the book, and it was so prevalent, was. Of course, each girl always chose, I think at Ed Sullivan show, we all chose our favorite Beatle. And um, mine was Sir Paul, and it's still, he still is after 55 years. He's but, not in um, danger of losing the title? No. <laughs> no, but the funny thing is, is that, okay, so the day that Ringo Starr got married, and then the next day, my girlfriend, Kathy, came to school and she was in a state of shock. She was crying and we had to hold her up all day. She couldn't do anything at school. She was just too <laughs> upset that her beetle got married. The wow. same thing happened when George got married. My, my other girlfriend, Joanne, was a basket cage all day and crying and upset and nervous and we had to support her. So uh, we, we, we did stick with our Beatle buddies. We attended uh, Beatle films together several times. Of course, there was no videos or DVDs in those days. Uh, we bonded at birth, Beatle birthday parties. I used to hold a Beatle birthday party for John every year and one for Paul uh, in my parents' dining room where I managed to uh, with scotch tape, you know, tape up my posters on my mother's good wallpaper. Uh, that's another story. <laughs> oh, brother. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, we also called Liverpool once during one of the, it was Paul's birthday party. Um, I called on the one house phone we had long <laughs> distance, and my mother I'm wasn't sure your at parents home. appreciated that. <laughs> yeah, well, I was lucky because the overseas operator said, I'm sorry, love. He's not here, but you oh. should try his fan club. And that was great because we actually got to talk to someone with a British accent, which we were screaming all afternoon about. And um, the other thing is my mom didn't have to pay for the phone call because it didn't get through. That's but I, I, we, yeah, <laughs> it was it was a lot of fun. But we did we used to bond together outside hotels. We used to hang out uh, in you know at school and rec. I mean, that's where we got our albums, record stores, and A&P supermarkets. So that's where they sold them. A&P, so, um, okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I yeah. thought everybody ran to Woolworths or something. Yeah, Wool oh, Woolworths, they sold Beatle uh, stuff, you know, like the little bobblehead dolls and things. So, and they now cost, like, you have to take out a mortgage to buy one. Yeah, isn't that funny? I think I paid $3 each or two fifty dollars for mine. Oh man! So, like and I still years. have them. I still have all four, but did I don't you have the boxes. Remember Billy at Shea when you went or the shows? Did you buy anything at those? Did they sell anything? They didn't sell anything. They Not didn't even, even sell. Church? They didn't. They didn't even sell programs. They sold nothing. Wow. I mean, nothing. Believe me. the The, the only thing I remember of, of a program is when I saw the Doors in person at the arena in Philadelphia. Ooh. They had a program 
It was really cheesy. I still have it somewhere, <laughs> but it, it, it wasn't sold. I think they gave it to people and it had a lot of ads in it. And that was the only time. Yeah. The, out of all the early, early concerts. And I went to a lot of them. I mean, I went to the Mamas and the Papas and the Beach Boys and the Rolling Stones. All the early concerts, I can't remember anything that they sold except that cheesy program at the Doors concert. How many pages was that about that one, that program at the Doors? I would say about 12. And most of it was ads, some kind of record ads. This is the Bob is a Pest section of the show. Somebody could you Xerox that for me or scan that to me? Okay, I'll right. find I'll, it. I've got, I know I have the it in my closet. Divorce. Yeah, and I, and I bet if I sent them that scan, they would not have seen that, and they'd probably get a real kick out of it. Yeah, I have it somewhere. I've got to check out where I, I because it's it was so cheesy. I mean, it was it was in color and it was a little bit oversized, but it was like you know what what's this you know and it that's the <laughs> only time I've seen anything, and at all the Beatle concerts, nothing. In fact. I held on to my tickets. I still have my tickets from wow. all three concerts. But the first concert, which was a convention hall concert, they ripped that ticket in half. So oh. I only have half of it. I have it's on the back. It's actually on the back cover of my book. So that's uh, pretty, half that's pretty neat. To have Let me flip yeah. the book over here, and there are the tickets. And I see the one that's ripped. The other yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was they're the worth, first. They're yeah. Hard. Now, you've been talking about kinship with the fans and stuff. And I know today you have some pretty close friends who wrote books. Today, maybe they'll come on the show with you next time. And oh. I'm just wondering what it's like still following them today. And you still have close bonds with people. Like you were telling me your friends wrote books. Can you tell yes. us a little bit about them and stuff? Okay. Um, through Beetlefest, uh, through the years, I've met many people and also online. And uh, one of my closest friends is named uh, Pat uh, Mancuso and she has written a book she had the only legitimate fan club that was official of uh, George Harrison's fan club and he actually signed the charter um, and she has written a book uh, called do you want to know a secret a few years ago um, and she would she would love to, to come on your show and talk about her years with the fan club and also the fact that she went over to England a few times and she met George at his home twice. And well, she that's has pictures. Really impressive. Wow. Yeah, she has great pictures of when she met George. If she and can send those over to Warren sometime and you guys come on the show, we could put those in the background video and I bet the fans would love that. Oh, I betcha. I betcha. She she has a, and she has a great story. Um it's and as I said, we're we're pretty. You want close to tell to it me. now and ruin it for her? No, no, do no. She you can don't tell it want to be a thousand picture. times better than I could ever. <laughs> it's very intri you know, intricate, and uh, she she has a. Um, I think it would, she'd be great to have on your show. Um, my other friend is is Marty Edwards. Marty has written a book, uh, sixteen and sixty four. It is a memoir. A bit like mine she talks about when she was 14 and 15 and 16 and what she did was she was from Chicago and she was president of the Beatles fan club in Chicago Not too and sure. this led to her meeting the B personally in an auditorium uh, before the concert when she was I think 16 as she was to give them a special plaque as president of the fan club. She's got plenty of pictures of that, of meeting them face to face and giving them this plaque uh, when she was a teenager. Well, that would be awesome. And Warren could like work those in in the video. So that you got to ask them to come on with you, all three of you. Oh yeah, they're, and they're, you know, their stories are different or a lot like my stories. Uh, we're all from, well, Pat and I are from Philadelphia area, but Marty was from Chicago. So she's got some, they both have great stories to tell. And uh, the three of us are first generation fans. I like to call us vintage fans. I think that's a nice term. <laughs> so, I like it. You know. Yeah, vintage. Uh, and we, you know, we, we're getting older. Some of us, you know, aren't it's traveling. It's a rumor. The hmm? 
That's just a rumor. Well, yeah, that is a rumor. That's true. You know, but when you hear the song, you know, when I'm 64, we all passed that a while ago. So <laughs> it's, a, it's the magic of radio. So everybody's 29 to me. That's right. That's right. <laughs> now, when we talk all the time, we always say Beatle maniacs and Beatle mania. We say it so often. But to you, how would you really describe what Beatlemania was? What does it mean to you? There's no right yeah. answer here. Actually, in my book, I do outline at, in the beginning what exactly is a Beatlemaniac. That's why I, I asked the question. At, I, that's I, I, right. I delved into and your I book. Looked, I loved it. I looked at that. Yes. There's a difference between a Beatlemaniac and what I call an ordinary fan. Um, I think that true... Vintage Beatle maniacs for first generation Beatle maniacs. We actually lived, dreamed, slept, and schemed to celebrate and meet our favorite group. Um, everything in our lives for those couple years revolved around the Beatles movies, uh, decorating our room, what we listened to, all the crazy schemes and things that we tried to meet them. That's a Beatle maniac. Uh, we we weren't. I, I can't say. You know, people say, "Well, you do know these lyrics, you know, in the third stanza of this song." And what, no, we don't. We were more with the. <clears throat> we loved the music, but we were more with the culture of Beatle mania, of be or the Beatles. Where an ordinary or a typical fan, they enjoy the music. They might have went to the movies once to see the films. Uh, so there's a, that difference between, I, I say in the book, the difference between being a fanatic or a fan addict and a, just being a fan. And that's, that's the, we were addicted to all things Beatle, <laughs> which was well, cute at, the, at 15. Very good answer. And, you know, now we're going we're gonna to go over the sea of time and we're going to reach out into the Beatles kingdom and call their leader, Sir Warren Brown. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> you got some fab stories there, Patricia. Um, oh, thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm enjoying them all, yeah. Um, <laughs> when you look back on your wonderful book, uh, do you have any particular sections or memories that jump out as your favorites and why? Yeah, you know, I think rather than just talking about a favorite book section, I feel that this was a growing up or coming of age saga, which makes that book so special to me. It's actually, there's three parts in this book. It starts when I'm a very, very young 13 year old, you know, worried about my pimples and if I'm you know, going to ever <laughs> find a boyfriend, you know. And then, then it goes on the middle section is I call it the adventurous Beatlemaniac era section of the book. Uh, and then the the end of the book is finally when I, I finally start growing up, uh, if you call it that. Uh, I was a more mature, you know, going into university student. Uh, so it bridges, it bridges this coming of age tale. So um, I think it's really a memoir that, I'm, I'm, my favorite, or, or actually the favorite parts are the three parts. It's a three life stages where the Beatles actually pay, played a starring role. And it helped me grow up, too, by the way. Right. That's wonderful. Um, your, your book cover is delightful, and I love graphics. Um, I don't know if you know or not, but I'm a graphics artist. Yeah, I've heard, yeah. <laughs> and I do love the graphics on your book. Um, how did you come up with the cover for the book? This, this is an interesting story. Um, when I graduated, it, it's a little long story, but I'll get there. When I, when I graduated university, I, I was a journalism student. Um, and that, thanks to the Beatles, they actually helped me become a journalist. And that's another story. But um, when I graduated, I before I graduated, I got a job part-time and then full-time at the Philadelphia Evening and Sunday Bulletin, which was the biggest daily evening paper, which was 100 and some years old in Philadelphia. Um, I did all kinds of women's stories and feature stories and 
fashion and things. But then we had a Sunday magazine and it was a color magazine. And um, I went to my uh, editor of the Sunday magazine and I, and I said to her, it's now 1974. It's 10 years after the Beatles hit America. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to write a Sunday feature story on Beatlemania and ha what it was like because I lived it. And my, my editor, Sunday editor, she said, hey, that's a great idea. We'll, we'll do it a big, we'll, we'll get you a good photographer. We'll take some pictures uh, in color because uh, the magazine, Sunday magazine was color. And uh, you know, we can illustrate it that way. They got, they, you, we had about 24 photographers on staff in those days. It was a big newspaper. And they um, used a, a, a chap by the name of Sam Nacella. He was a middle-aged uh, photographer who actually f was used to do fashion for the newspaper. And he did a lot of mm -hmm. feature stuff. And he actually said, okay, Patty, he said, uh, let's use your memorabilia as a backdrop for the picture. And I said, okay. And he said, where is it? And I said, it's my mom's house. So we went to my mom's uh, house. He and his assistant set up my memorabilia in my parents' rec room. Uh, and they, they said, what do you got to wear? And I said, well, I have an, an old mini dress back that I can still fit into. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, oh boy, it's right for ten years before. So I says I and I have a John Lennon cap and an old guitar that's cheap, but it's an old guitar. So he said, We'll use those as props and we'll we'll hold drape all your Beatlemania stuff around. And it, on my mother's it was my parents like uh orange shag rug, if you remember the seventies. So uh that is the picture. And that was used to illustrate my article. Uh, which is in the book, uh, too. Um, mm. And then when I was looking to use this picture, my, my publisher, who's a wonderful lady uh, from Sinran Press named Holly, she said, let's see if we can use it for the cover. Uh, um, and then we ha I had to get permission because the newspapers closed and my old university gave permission. Could they own the rights to all the pictures and the articles uh, from the old bulletin? And I had to pay. <laughs> for wow. my own picture wow. and my own article. That was that was the end of it. But it got on the cover. That's my cover story. So. Uh, that's that's a good story. And uh, it's a shame you got to pay for your own photographs. <laughs> yep. Well, you know, the, the problem is, is when you're a journalist for a daily or any kind of newspaper, you don't own the rights to anything. Your newspaper owns the rights. So um, I did not own the rights to my story or my photo photograph which is interesting <laughs> yes it is um do you have a favorite album or period in the band's history in which and which beetle is your favorite and why okay well i think i mentioned this once or twice to people that i am afraid of the choosing a favorite beetle album or song is akin to like picking your favorite child when you have a family so I can't, I can't even attempt to choose uh, one song or, or album, but I can tell you, of course, that my favorite Beatle is still uh, Sir Paul uh, since February 9th, 1964, um, which is a long time. And uh, it was Love at First Sight <laughs> on the Ed Sullivan Show. And why? I thought he was a cute, cute little guy. And I liked his eyes, and I liked the way he sang, and I liked that he was left-handed, like me. Mm -hmm. So it all kind of played into it when you're 14. Um, and the funny thing about Sir Paul or whatever is that when you're, you were an original fan back then, you kind of took on the attributes of that Beatle. For mm -hmm. example, John fans often wore John Lennon caps. Ringo fans often wore a lot of rings and a St. Christopher medal. Um, <laughs> true. And uh, Paul fans were happy if they were left-handed. <laughs> and also, I learned that I have a P because my name is Patricia, and of course his name is Paul. 
I mimicked, uh, not mimicked, but I learned how to copy the P in Paul perfectly. To this day, the P in Patricia is exactly like his autographed P in Paul. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's five years and I still do that. I, it just, I learned how to do it and I did it thousands of times on my copy books at school, you know, when I was bored mm -hmm. and I've still, you know, it's, it's just the funny thing that not too many people think of that, but we all took <laughs> after our favorite Beatles somehow. You know? Yes. Yeah. I understand all of that. Uh, I'm a fan of John Lennon's and of course I have several of his uh, hats. <laughs> ah, yes, you do. Yep. Yep. Uh, uh, Bob uh, touched on this a little earlier that you saw the Beatles as a group. Can you uh, tell us about the times you saw them uh, solo? And okay. Yep, I sure can. Um, interesting thing is that um, um, I think that um, I've seen both. Sir Ringo and Sir Paul in concert solo many, many, many times. Um, each time is magical. You know, I, um, I'm, I'm always so excited to get to see them. Not only do I see them, but I always take my twin daughters. They're adults now. Oh. But I always take my twin daughters with me because I think it's going to be wonderful in the future that they can tell their children and grandchildren that they right. actually saw two Beatles. Uh, that's, that's great. And the last time I saw Sir Paul was on June 14th this year in Arlington, Texas. And it was a phenomenal concert. Uh, I was downstairs on the floor in, in row E. So I saw him pretty close up. Okay. Do you... Uh... Do you still scream at the concerts? Oh, no. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. I just sit there and stare and stare. And, and, and of course, I, I don't like when everybody stands up and jumps up. I, I wish people would just sit so we could all see. But be, because there's these big television sets or whatever it is, that, you know, that you can see them really close up, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't make much difference. But I always try to get up close so I can, you know, at least see see him a little better than I did in Philadelphia in Convention Hall 55 years ago. <laughs> and and the closer you get to Paul, the more likely you are to get on stage with him because he picks someone from the audience. Um, yes, every, yes every he does. Show. Yeah, he didn't do that here in Arlington. He oh, did wow. not do that, uh, which was interesting. Yeah, uh, totally. But it was, it was an, you know, he, he plays for so many hours. I don't know how he does it without taking a break, but you know, that's true. It, yeah. <laughs> he puts on one good show though. That's for sure. Oh yeah. He is an entertainer of the first degree. <laughs> that's for sure. I agree. I agree. Yeah. And with all that being said, I'm going to hand it back over to the bulldog. Hey, okay, bulldog. nice talking to you. <laughs> nice talking to you too, Patricia. <laughs> you awake bulldog. I'm awake. I'm preparing to go here. Uh, all right. Okay. Good. You got the floor, sir, Bulldog. Start barking. I was just wondering, when you first started, you got a column. And how did that come about? Okay, that was interesting. Um, I wrote a column with my girlfriend, Diane, for a long while. For, I guess it was freshman year in high school until I was in college. And that came about in a very interesting way. Um, I wanted to go to a press conference for the Beatles in the worst way. And they were going to appear, as I, I've been telling you, in September 64 in Philadelphia. So I thought, how am I going to get a press conference, uh, get to the press conference? So I called up our, our our local newspaper, you know, neighborhood local weekly newspaper called the Southwest Philadelphia Globe Times. And I was lucky enough to talk to the editor, a very nice lady by the name of Pat. And I explained my, my idea. I was a young woman and a young girl and I wanted to see a press conference and I would write about it for her. And she laughed and she said, I'm sorry, we're such a small little newspaper. We don't 
have any clout to get these kind of press passes for anything. She said, but she says, she talked to me for a few minutes. She says, how would you like to write a column for us about teenagers? And we'll call it teen to teen. And I said, oh, okay, what do you want me to do? And she said, well, you could write about the Beatles. You could write about fashion. You could write about music. You could write about anything, you know, local shops that sell stuff to teenagers, anything you want. And she said, uh, the only thing, of course, we couldn't pay you, <laughs> you know. So at 14, I wasn't too worried about getting paid. And uh, I agreed to do that. And my girlfriend, Diane, who was one of my Beatle buddies, and I started writing together. And then once in a while, she'd write a column and I'd write the next week. And then she stopped writing and I continued until I was well into college. Now, this this column uh, was a about every other week first and then every week it was actually I, I i kept every one of them and i put them in scrapbooks that's another thing beetle fans used to do a scrapbook but in the old-fashioned way um we um i kept all these columns and they came in very handy when i wrote my book because it's actually the culture of teenagers in the mid-60s that come out so strongly in these columns so I've used a lot of it in in the uh, in in the book, and I reprinted some of the columns as well. Well, that's really cool that you got to do that. Then another thing that was really cool is you mentioned uh, in your book Victor Spinetti. He's mentioned with great affection. Um, he's oh. like a gem of a man. Can you tell us about him and also how you came to know him personally and uh, what your okay. kind of him were like? Okay. Well, actor Victor Spinetti. Uh, was our, our little group's muse. I call him our muse. Um, our Beatle buddies met Victor on September 16th, 1964, because I wrote a letter to him. He was staying in Philadelphia for a few months uh, as he was on, um, it was pre-Broadway tryout for a uh, musical from England called Oh, What a Lovely War. It was a, a production that he was in. He had already just appeared in A Hard Day's Night, and everybody was familiar, all the Beatle fans were familiar with him. So when his name appeared in the newspaper uh, that he was staying in Philly and he had been in, you know, A Hard Day's Night, I, I really don't know how I found out what hotel he was staying in. I might have taken a guess, and I wrote a letter to the Bellevue Stratford Hotel, which was the hotel in those days. And he answered me. He wrote back to me in a couple days. And uh, he said, stop up at the, um, at the theater, which was in Philadelphia, where they were doing rehearsals. Um, so I, I did. I stopped up at the theater after school with my girlfriends and found out that I was part of a group because there were other Beatle fans that would wait for him by the stage door for him to tell stories. He loved telling stories about the Beatles and making a uh, hard day's night. Uh, so almost every day after school, we, our high school was in Center City, Philly. So every day in our uniforms, went to Catholic school, we would trudge down there and we'd wait for Victor to get done rehearsal with some other girls. He'd either come out and tell us stories outside or sometimes he'd invite us into the theater, which was empty, and we'd all sit and listen to his stories because um, Victor was very kind. He was very giving. He said he knew how it felt to actually yearn after these stars because he, he did that when he was a teenager. So, um, and you, he said, I know how it feels, probably never meet them. So he knew how it felt and he wanted to be nice to the fans. Um, at this time, we really liked Victor, our little Beatle buddy group, uh, the four of us. And we said, we wanted to make a, a, and found a fan club <laughs> called the official Victor Spinetti fan club of America, chapter one, Philadelphia. So in late, late September 64, 
we founded a fan club for him. It wasn't the only fan club he had. He had fan clubs in New York. I think he had one in Boston, and he had them in England. So we all kind of, you know, kept in touch with one another through newsletters and things of that sort. Um, the fan club existed for three years. And if you read my book, uh, the friendship with Victor is intertwined throughout the book. Um, I can say that Victor was an extraordinary gentleman who did not mind his extra fame that was due to the Beatles. He kind of honored it. Um, and he and I um, had remained friends. I got went to see him in England uh, when I was working and I was single. Uh, and I spent New Year's with him and his friends. Um, I also um, remained friends with him, phone calls and, and letters, uh, until his sad passing on June 18th, 2012, when he was 82. Well, it's a wonderful story. On page 58 of your Thank book, you. you have a photo signed by Victor Spinetti, and he signed his forehead, and he wrote something on his upper lip. I'm putting you on the spot, can, can you recall what he wrote in his upper lip? Okay, let me see. I'm looking, I'm looking right now at the book. Hold on. Sure. Page 58, huh? Yes. I think it just says, Victor Spinetti, oh, his upper lip, lip says, sincerely. There you go. I couldn't make it out, so I was wondering yeah. what it said. Yeah, um, sincerely. And then I have it in the, in the book, too, is, is a copy of the first page of the letter I think he wrote me. From the Bellevue Stratford Hotel. That's well, that too. Yeah. Great keepsakes for a Beatle fan. Yeah. Um, good, good. No, it was on September 11th. I'm looking at 1964, and that was the first. They, my my uh, publisher put the first page of the letter that he wrote us, right before we met him. And uh, as I said, I cannot say enough wonderful things about Victor and. Um, I did interview him the last time in 2007 when I made an effort to go to Las Vegas to see him at Beetlefest in the summer of 2007 where he was going to appear. I just wanted to spend some time with him, take him out to dinner and see him, you know, face to face. I knew he was getting older and uh, I thought it could be the last time we meet, you know, and it was. Sadly. Well, you had that experience, though, and, and uh, that's incredible that you became such, you know, friends for such a length of time. He sounds like a nice person. Oh, yeah. Believe me, he was. He did a lot for his fans, and he he gave us gifts. I mean, he gave us uh, the autographs. I have all four autographs on, on a plane menu, which was given to our fan club. Um, I have a, a wonderful little postcard uh, with his with, with Paul sign wishing me a happy birthday because my mother had wrote to Victor when they were filming help and said it's Patty's birthday can you do something special so he got Paul to sign a postcard which was had the Alps in the back from the Austrian Alps and then the caught my piece de resistance he had the studio hairdresser in London uh, give him a lock of Paul's hair for me. Well, so he certainly cleaned up in the memorabilia and memories department. Not too bad. Well, we have a standing joke in my family that now I have Paul's hair that I can clone him. I have his DNA. <laughs> we have the technology. There you go. That's yeah. right. I could. I can have my Paul Butler sometime in the future. You know. Um, somebody but I has. Did, I, I, I've kept all this stuff, you know, and, and uh, it's it's amazing to have a lock of Paul McCartney's hair. So, and I, oh, by the way, this is pure Beatlemania. I slept with that lock of hair encased in plastic <laughs> like a relic under my pillow for two years. Wow. <laughs> All right. Another <laughs> person you mentioned meeting is Wilfred Bramble. Not okay. everyone is a gem. Can you tell us about Wilfred and your Wilfred. interaction with him and, and what was that like? Okay. Well, Wilfred Bramble, if people don't know too much about him, it was an actor, an old actor, uh, who was uh, played Paul's grandfather in A Hard Day's Night. He was a character actor. 
but he was also known, very, very well known in the UK for a long-running TV comedy show called Steptoe and Son. Um, Steptoe and Son ran from 1962 in England to 1974, so it was very popular. And the funny thing that people don't know is later, the U.S. TV series Sanford, Sanford and Son was based on Wilfred Bramble's British TV show. So, but anyway, he died yeah. in, in 1985. And he, he, as I said, he was known as Paul's grandfather in the movie. He was very clean. He was a very clean man. But sad part of it is in 1960, uh, I guess it was 1965, my experience with him, with, Ms., with Wilfred, was that it, picture this, Christmas Eve, 1965. We're having slushy snow flurries in Philadelphia. It's cold. I take the trolley with my girlfriend, Diane, from home, and it's dusk, over to the Schubert Theater in Philadelphia, where Mr. Bramble was starring in a theater presentation, uh, and I can't remember the name of it offhand. Uh, we waited outside the stage door on Christmas Eve in 1965 for hours in the snow for him <laughs> to get his autograph and talk to him because we thought he was going to be like, you know, uh, uh, Victor, a real nice guy. Well, he didn't want to have anything to do with us when he finally left the stage door and, and came outside. He did, I mean, I have it still. He had kind of hurried and, and wrote his autograph on a, on a piece of scrap paper. He wasn't very nice. And um, that's the only image or the only thought I have about him because I was cold. It was Christmas Eve and uh, I never really got to talk to him, but I did get his autograph. And I think there were some worse stories about him later, but. Oh, yes. Yes. I didn't want to go into that, but yes, he wasn't a very clean man. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. That's right. <laughs> he was a uh, mean Mr. Mustard. That's Time right. Two. Absolutely. <laughs> That's now, you've, right. Lived, you've lived in a lot of places, and um, I was wondering, are there different attitudes, the way they see the Beatles, you know, perceived differently, and do you see oh. any of the Beatles in Europe? Okay, well, I, I, I think I, in my book, at, in the back of my book, it says that I've lived 23 years in Europe, in Northern Europe, um, from 1975, actually to 2010, back and forth. And I lived in Sweden, outside of Stockholm, and I lived in Finland, uh, in Helsinki, and in Turku, the, to, the, the capital and another big city. Um, Basically, the years that I lived there, the Beatles weren't that crazy popular as they were in the States. Uh, the funny thing, ironically, is when I moved to Sweden in 1975, I went there to graduate school. Uh, the big thing was, as you can imagine, ABBA. <laughs> Everything yeah. was ABBA. The albums were ABBA. I mean, the whole world... The world was ABBA in Stockholm in 1975 to 1980. So um, there wasn't, they just choked the Beatles right out. And of course, when I moved over there, the Beatles were no more. You know, they were, had broken up and, you know, Paul was starting with Wings and things. But I don't even remember a Wings tour that I went to uh, or a Wings concert in, in Sweden or actually in, I saw Paul in, in Finland but that, that was a solo concert. Uh, I think it was 2004 in a very wet, uh, open uh, uh, football stadium, <laughs> if I remember. My family's Swedish. I actually have more relatives in Sweden than here. Oh. When I was a kid, they used to send me ABBA records. And yes. I'd be like, I, like, I think they were fantastic songwriters. And they were oh, really they, I love them. And you know something? The funny thing is, is that... Um, if you go to Stockholm now to, or to visit your relatives, they have a marvelous ABBA museum. Well, I have to check that out. But I used to think 
I like the ABBA records, but couldn't you send me a Swedish Beatle record and import? That would be pretty cool. Yeah, and well, I, like I used to have, and I, I've been looking for it. I had a 45, the, the German, uh, I want to hold your hand. Come give me diner, hon. I have that. Uh, I had a German pen pal, and she sent it to me. But I, for That's some reason, it, it's not with all my albums. I've kept all my albums. And I'm going to keep looking, and I somewhere tucked between something is my little German 45. <laughs> well, I hope that one shows up. And now it's we good. go back again to that Beatles kingdom and its leader, Sir Warren Brown. Yeah, Patricia, my, my wife's a big Ava fan, too. She loves oh, well, Ava. Yeah. I think it's so amazing that uh, you slept with Paul's hair, too. <laughs> I think that's great. You know, they also have a picture going around on the Internet of, um, I think, the dentist that pulled John's tooth. Oh, wow. And oh, he, he kept that, and he said he was going to uh, clone that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I... I don't think anybody agreed with that, but uh, no. that that was going around the internet there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned also uh, Beetle Fest and conventions that you've uh, attended. Yeah. Uh, are there any upcoming ones that you plan on attending? Yeah, actually, I, I just sent in my reservation for my table for the the one um, in March tw on March twenty seventh to the 29th next year, the New York Metro Fest, which is held in New Jersey at the Hyatt Regency in New Jersey. So I, I'm going to that one. Um, my, my other friends are going to Chicago with me to the Chicago Fest next August, which is usually the first, I think the first week in August. So I will be there. Um, and I just returned about a month ago from the uh, Beatles at the Ridge in Arkansas, I was at that symposium. So I try to get around and I do get to the fest. Uh, I've been appearing at the fest with my book for, I, I guess almost a year and a half now since it's been published a little over a year. So um, it's like hit Chicago and New York. Yep. Yeah, the Beatles at the Ridge, I heard that was a very nice event. Uh, oh, wonderful. Very homey and folksy, and the people in that town just love the Beatles because the Beatles had appeared there and had uh, back in '64 or something. So the, the little town it has a little main street. It's decorated with Beatle art, and they just just love Beatle fans. So every year now they have this symposium, and they do treat the authors very well. We were in a nice air conditioned. Uh, studio and the, the townspeople nice. made food for us for lunch and it was a buffet and it was just lovely. Wow, very, that, very sound, lovely. Yeah. that sounds really nice. I yeah. like to go to that one time. I, rec I, I recommend it. I do. Along with the fest, you know, which is also fun. Right. So. Uh, you mentioned the one in New York. I, I plan on going to that one this year. So hopefully I will see you there. I will see you. I'll have a table. Uh, with the authors, and I guess usually they always they make us appear on panel discussions, and I do a PowerPoint. Uh, right. So I'll be there, uh, and and you know on stage and stuff. So I'll see you, but I'll be at my table sitting there, so we can we can share, a, you know, you know uh, uh, some some talk and maybe a, a coke or something or whatever. You know? and that I'm sounds, hungry sitting there. And that yeah. sounds good to me. I like to get an autographed copy of your book, also. That would be oh, nice. I, I will send one to you before then. So. Oh, so, I yeah. appreciate that. Oh. I, as I mentioned before, I'm a graphics artist. And I usually send out a little gift to uh, our guests that appear on our show. Yeah. So, so I will also be asking for your address, and I'll oh, be. Oh well, thank you. Thank I'll you. be sending you out a little something also. That's sweet. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. You're welcome very much. Uh, where can where can fans f uh, order your book or find your book and um, also follow your work? Okay, I will tell you. Um, I guess the best place is um, you can find it on Amazon. 
you can buy it through my my publisher. I have a bona fide publisher uh, who publishes memoirs and biographies, and it's Sinrin Press, C Y N R E N. They're my publisher out of Philadelphia. Um, you can also uh, go on my website, which is all together diary of a beetle maniac dot com if someone wants an autograph copy i can sell it that way um i do um ha i'm in some barnes and nobles uh i know i'm here in texas uh i'm in some bookstores in philadelphia um also um i have a lot of social media sites i do have as i just mentioned my website i have uh, Facebook, which is under my name, Patricia Gallo Stenman. I have a professional Facebook, which is under Diary of a Beetle Maniac, and that's not one word. <laughs> mm. uh, I'm on in Instagram under Diary of a Beetle Maniac, uh, and I'm also on LinkedIn under my own name, Patricia Gallo Stenman. So I try to use those sites at least once or twice a month to promote the book and uh my my website uh, i can tell you i write a blog every month and it's kind of wacky sometimes the topics i pick out but it you know i wrote about for example i wrote about paul's concert uh in june uh i've written about mod clothes i i write about all different kinds of things uh about rock stars getting older and what we can learn from them as they get older and get on the stage and move around. So my blog's kind of a fun thing and I try to keep it up. So, um, yeah, if you'd like to check my, out my website, go ahead. <laughs> and on your blog, are you allowed to share pictures and artwork on there too? Uh, I am allowed to share pictures. Yeah. I, um, I have put, I put every, Every month, I usually use one picture. Uh, a couple times, uh, I've used two. Yeah. I would love to do some artwork for you, and you can post it on there if you'd oh, like. Lovely. That would be great. I appreciate that. You give me a, a topic and what you would like, and, and I'll create something for you. Okay. I will write that down so I don't forget artwork. Okay. That's, that's <laughs> and you can, con you can contact me on Messenger on Facebook. Okay. Or um, through, the, through the Beatles Kingdom or Tomorrow Never Knows with uh, Bob Wilson yeah. and Warren Brown. Okay. That sounds good. And maybe you just send me your contact information. You have my contact information. So one, we'll get together that way. I and think that sounds great. good to me. Thank you so much, Warren. Uh, no, thank you very much. Um, we have a, a tradition closing out the show by singing the end with our guests. Okay. Um, it's not about great singing because I sure in the heck can't sing at all. <laughs> uh, but it, it's all about closing on a nice note. And yeah. um, would you like to sing with us? Okay. I can sure do that. I'll sing with you guys. Okay. Okay. I'm going to hand it off to Bob, and he's going to get us started. And um, he's going to take the beginning, I'm going, to, or you're going to take the middle, and I'm going to take the end. Okay. Thank you, dear. Thank you. And in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. Yes. Yay. <laughs> all right, all you Beatle friends, until next time, Beatle on. <laughs>